Second meditation, in which the attempt is made to form a true conception of the elemental or etheric body. Through the idea which the soul has to form in connection with the fact of death, it may be driven into complete uncertainty with regard to its own being. This will be the case when it believes that it cannot obtain knowledge of any other world but the world of the senses, and of that which the intellect is able to ascertain about this world. The ordinary life of the soul directs its attention to the physical body. It sees that body being absorbed after death into the workshop of nature, which has no connection with that which the soul experiences before death as its own existence. The soul may indeed know, through the preceding meditation, that the physical body during life bears the same relation to it as after death, but this does not lead it further than to the acknowledgement of the inner independence of its own experiences up to the moment of death. What happens to the physical body after death is evident from the observation of the outer world. But such observation is not possible with regard to its inner experience. Insofar then as it perceives itself through the senses, the soul, in its ordinary life, cannot see beyond the boundary of death. If the soul is incapable of forming any ideas which go beyond the outer world, which absorbs the body after death, then, with regard to all that concerns its own being, it is unable to look into anything but empty nothingness on the other side of death. If this is to be otherwise, the soul must perceive the outer world by other means than those of the senses and of the intellect connected with them. These themselves belong to the body and decay together with it. What they tell us can lead to nothing but to the result of the first meditation. And this result consists merely in the soul being able to say to itself, I am bound to my body. This body is subject to natural laws which are related to me in the same way as all other natural laws. Through them I am a member of the outer world and a part of this world is expressed in my body a fact which I realize most distinctly when I consider what the outer world does to that body after death. During life it gives me senses and an intellect, which make it impossible for me to see how matters stand with regard to my soul's experiences on the other side of death. Such a statement can only lead to two results. Either any further investigation into the riddle of the soul is suppressed, and all efforts to obtain knowledge of this subject are given up, or else efforts are made to obtain by the inner experience of the soul that which the outer world refuses. These efforts may bring about an increase of power and energy with regard to this inner experience such as it would not have in ordinary life. In ordinary life, man has a certain amount of strength in his inner experiences, in his life of feeling and thought. He thinks, for instance, a certain thought as often as there is an inner or outer impulse to do so. Any thought may, however, be chosen out of the rest and voluntarily repeated again and again without any outer reason, and with such intense energy as actually to make it live as an inner reality. Such a thought may, by repeated effort, be made the exclusive object of our inner experience. And while we do this, we can keep away all outer impressions and memories which may arise in the soul. It is then possible to turn such a complete surrender to certain thoughts or feelings exclusive of all others into a regular inner activity. If, however, such an inner experience is to lead to really important results, it must be undertaken according to certain tested laws. Such laws are recorded by the science of spiritual life. In my book, Knowledge of the Higher Worlds and its Attainment, a great number of these rules or laws are mentioned. Through such methods, we obtain a strengthening of the powers of inner experience. 
this experience becomes in a certain way condensed. What is brought about by this we learn through that observation of ourselves which sets in when the inner activity described has been continued for a sufficiently long time. It is true that much patience is required before convincing results appear, and if we are not disposed to exercise such patience for years, we shall obtain nothing of importance. Here it is only possible to give one example of such results, for they are of many varieties, and that which is mentioned here is adapted to further the particular method of meditation which we are now describing. A man may carry out the inner strengthening of the life of his soul, which has been indicated for a long period, without perhaps anything happening in his inner life which is able to alter his usual way of thinking with regard to the world. Suddenly, however, the following may occur. Naturally, the incident to be described might not occur in exactly the same way to two different persons. But if we arrive at a conception of one experience of this kind, we shall have gained an understanding of the whole matter in question. A moment may occur in which the soul gets an inner experience of itself in quite a new way. At the beginning, it will generally happen that the soul during sleep wakes up, as it were, in a dream. But we feel at once that this experience cannot be compared with ordinary dreams. We are completely shut off from the world of sense and intellect, and yet we feel the experience in the same way as when we are standing fully awake before the outer world in ordinary life. We feel compelled to picture the experience in ourselves. For this purpose we use ideas such as we have in ordinary life, but we know very well that we are experiencing things different from those to which such ideas are normally attached. These ideas are only used as a means of expression for an experience which we have not had before, in which we are also able to know that it is impossible for us to have in ordinary life. We feel, for instance, as though thunderstorms were all around us. We hear thunder and see lightning. And yet we know we are in our own room. We feel permeated by a force previously quite unknown to us. Then, we imagine we see rents in the walls around us, and we feel compelled to say to ourselves or to someone we think is near us, I am now in great difficulties, the lightning is going through the house and taking hold of me, I feel it seizing and dissolving me. When such a series of representations has been gone through, the inner experience passes back to ordinary soul conditions. We find ourselves again in ourselves with the memory of the experience just undergone. If this memory is as vivid and accurate as any other, it enables us to form an opinion of the experience. We then have a direct knowledge that we have gone through something which cannot be experienced by any physical sense nor by ordinary intelligence for we feel that the description just given and communicated to others or to ourselves is only a means of expressing the experience. Although the expression is a means of understanding the fact of the experience, it has nothing in common with it. We know that we do not need any of our senses in having such an experience. One who attributes it to a hidden activity of the senses or of the brain does not know the true character of the experience. He adheres to the description which speaks of lightning, thunder, and rents in the walls, and therefore he believes that this experience of the soul is only an echo of ordinary life. He must consider the thing as a vision in the ordinary sense of the word. He cannot think otherwise. He does not take into consideration, however, that when one describes such an experience, one only uses the words lightning, thunder, rents in the walls, as pictures of that which has been experienced, and that one must not mistake the pictures for the experience itself. It is true that the matter appears to one as if one really saw these pictures, 
but one did not stand in the same relation to the phenomenon of the lightning in this case as when seeing a flash with the physical eye. The vision of the lightning is only something which, as it were, conceals the experience itself. One looks through the lightning to see something beyond which is quite different, to something which cannot be experienced in the outer world of sense. In order that a correct judgment may be made possible, it is necessary that the soul which has such experiences should, when they are over, be on a thoroughly sound footing with regard to the ordinary outer world. It must be able clearly to contrast what it has undergone as a special experience with its ordinary experience of the outer world. Those who in ordinary life are already disposed to be carried away by all kinds of wild imaginings regarding things are most unfit to form such a judgment. The more sound, or one might say sober, a sense of reality we have got, the more likely we are to form a true and therefore valuable judgment of such things. One can only attain to confidence in supersensible experiences when one feels with regard to the ordinary world that one clearly perceives its processes and objects as they really are. When all necessary conditions are thus fulfilled, and when we have reason to believe that we have not been misled by an ordinary vision, then we know that we have had an experience in which the body was not transmitting perceptions. We have had direct perception through the strengthened soul without the body. We have gained the certainty of an experience when outside the body. It is evident that in this sphere the natural differences between fancy or illusion and true observation made when outside the body cannot be indicated in any other way than in the realm of outer sense perception. It may happen that someone has a very active imagination with regard to taste and therefore at the mere thought of lemonade gets the same sensation as if he were really drinking it. The difference, however, in such a case becomes evident through the association of actual circumstances in life. And so it is also with those experiences which are made when we are out of the body. In order to arrive at a fully convincing conception in this sphere, it is necessary that we should become familiar with it in a perfectly healthy way and acquire the faculty of observing the details of the experience and correcting one thing by another. Through such an experience as the one described, we gain the possibility of observing that which belongs to our proper self, not only by means of the senses and intellect, in other words, the bodily instruments. Now we not only know something more of the world than those instruments will allow of, but we know it in a different way. This is especially important. A soul that passes through an inner transformation will more and more clearly comprehend that the oppressive problems of existence cannot be solved in the world of sense because the senses and the intellect cannot penetrate deeply enough into the world as a whole. Those souls penetrate deeper which so transform themselves as to be able to have experiences when outside the body and it is in the records which they are able to give of their experiences that the means for solving the riddles of the soul can be found. Now, an experience that occurs when outside the body is of a quite different nature from the one made when in the body. This is shown by the very opinion which may be formed about the experiences described when, after it is over, the ordinary waking condition of the soul is re-established and memory has come into a vivid and clear condition. The physical body is felt by the soul as separated from the rest of the world and seems only to have a real existence insofar as it belongs to the soul. It is not so, however, with that which we experience within ourselves and with regard to ourselves when outside the body, for then we feel ourselves linked to all that may be called the outer world. All our surroundings are felt as belonging to us, just as our hands do in the world of sense. 
There is no indifference to the world outside us when we come to the inner soul world. We feel ourselves completely grown together and woven into one with that which here may be called the world. Its activities are actually felt streaming through our own being. There is no sharp boundary line between an inner and an outer world. The whole environment belongs to the observing soul, just as our two physical hands belong to our physical head. In spite of this, however, we may say that a certain part of this outer world belongs more to ourselves than the rest of the environment, in the same way in which we speak of the head as independent of the hands or feet. Just as the soul calls a piece of the outer physical world its body, so, when living outside the body, it may also consider a part of the supersensible outer world as belonging to it. When we penetrate to an observation of the realm accessible to us beyond the world of the senses, we may very well say that a body unperceived by the senses belongs to us. We may call this body the elemental or etheric body, but in using the word etheric, we must not allow any connection with that fine matter which science calls ether to establish itself in our mind. Just as the mere reflection upon the connection between man and the outer world of nature leads to a conception of the physical body which agrees with facts, so does the pilgrimage of the soul into realms that can be perceived outside the physical body lead to the recognition of an elemental or etheric body or body of formative forces.